Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Mike Waring, and on behalf of the Science Coalition and the Association of American Universities, I want to welcome all of you and our audience to All Things Research. The Science Coalition and AAU are comprised of some of the nation's top public and private research universities. Uh, collectively, we share the goal of maintaining America's leadership in science and technology through strong and sustained funding for scientific research across all disciplines. We're looking forward to this afternoon's discussion between the senior research officers and the media here. Uh, just a couple of announcements before we get started. Obviously, for those of you there, if you haven't already done so, please mute or turn off your cell phone. We don't hate to have those little bells ringing during our program here today. Uh, we've decided to break our discussion into three topics uh, today to try to cover three things that we think are useful discussion areas. One is the connection between U.S. leadership in science and U.S. global competitiveness. The next is technology transfer and the role of universities in driving regional economic development. <clears throat> And the third is the intersection of science and politics. Now, there'll be other topics that people will want to bring up, and we'll have time at the end. I will surely make time at the end for sort of a grab bag of other topics people want to bring up uh, during the discussion. And while my job is to sort of direct the discussion, I don't want to ask all the questions. So hopefully our journalists will be here ready to jump in with your questions or comments as you go. Um, it might be useful if you, have, if you want to get into the discussion either as making a comment as an SRO or to ask a question, if you just give me a little sign and I'll try to call on people as I see them throughout the discussion. One last piece of business is we are recording, obviously, this discussion. So please use the microphones so that way we'll get everybody's comments for the record. And again, this is all on the record, of course. Uh, we thought about having the senior research officers um, sort of introduce themselves, but you've got their bios. We thought it might be more, more useful to have them go around one at a time and talk very briefly, very briefly, about one of the most exciting examples of research they have going on at their particular university. So I'm just going to start over here with Gloria Waters from Boston University. We'll go right around the table, 30, 45 seconds. Gloria, what's something really exciting happening at Boston University you can tell us about? So Ed Damiano, who is a faculty member in our College of Engineering, has just developed a wearable uh, artificial pancreas that is referred to as the bionic pancreas. And it automatically manages uh, type 1 diabetes. It pairs a smartphone with a continuous glucose monitor and then two other pumps that deliver precise doses of hormones. And the results of the first studies uh, with outpatients uh, and a mobile device were published just recently in the New England Journal of Medicine. And they're doing their final pivotal study before FDA approval. Glenn? So at uh, Texas A&M University, uh, we have uh, established a, uh, an emerging uh, program in vaccine development. Um, uh, the, uh, we have uh, a contract now with the federal government to, uh, to generate 50 million doses of a vaccine against any particular infectious agent that uh, might uh, occur naturally or, or be man-made uh, within a six-month period. And along those same lines, uh, we've uh, have been doing some genetic engineering in goats and now have a, uh, a model where we can generate malaria vaccine within the milk of goats. This is important because of the child death rate around the world associated with malaria and the fact that the malaria uh, vaccinations have to be refrigerated and can't be uh, distributed worldwide. If, if each, uh, villages, uh, each one of the villages had one of these goats, uh, they need only uh, have their children drink the milk and they would be protected from malaria. That's great. Robert Clark, what's happening in upstate New York? Well, we have a uh, faculty member, Henry Kautz, who's now the uh, director of our newly established Institute for Data Science. It really started as a partnership with New York State and the federal government. We have uh, about 50 million that we put in into the computing resources and another 50 million planned for investment. But Henry, uh, one, of his in one of the areas I thought was particularly interesting was the convergence of the uh, blending of social sciences and linguistics with computational sciences and the tracking of the outbreak of influenza uh, based upon tweets, so they could download tweets from social networks and using some basic semantics on linguistics, figure out uh, how influenza is moving through a city, and use the same technology actually to predict which restaurants might, you might be most likely to encounter food poisoning. That sounds like very useful information. Yes. <laughs> Don, how about Penn? Yeah, so um, we have um, an exciting uh, result coming out of an interdisciplinary team led by Charlie Johnson in the physics department um, that is, that is uh, bringing people together to design proteins from scratch, so de novo proteins that are designed to have particular function, and in this case, to have the function to be able to recognize molecules in vapors. In addition, they have the function to be able to connect to something like a carbon nanotube or a, or a piece of graphene, and therefore can be incorporated into devices. So. Um, 
these devices have the capability of sensing then chemicals in vapors with a, a thousand times higher sensitivity than has been demonstrated to date. And ha it's a platform technology so that it has the potential to um, detect, it's been demonstrated to detect uh, biomarkers for cancer from human breath. And it can detect things like um, toxic chemical leakages in industrial environments. So it's really broadly range. So the, the fundamental science to the application of the device is pretty broad. And in the, in the context of enabling this to, to make um, inroads as real devices, they have uh, started a startup company called Graphene Frontiers, which has found an economical way to mass produce graphene that will allow this platform technology um, to be marketable, as well as other kinds of device technologies. Carol Whitaker, what's going on in Columbus we would like to hear about? So at Ohio State, there's a, um, there's a team of researchers out of neurosurgery who's working on deep brain stimulation. And this technology involves um, basically a pacemaker for the brain where it can essentially stimulate or suppress neurotransmitter release. And while this is, is well known for treating things like Parkinson's and, and basic tremors, it's now being expanded much, much more than that to Alzheimer's, to migraines, to multiple sclerosis. And recently, and it was written up in the Washington Post actually twice, about uh, treatment of, of quadriplegia, where a, um, a young man actually uh, could move his fingers for the first time after the um, implantation of a, um, of a uh, brain microchip. Very, very, very exciting, and the state of Ohio was just awarded $21 million to, uh, to this research team led by Ali Razai, and that's, that's partnered with $140 million of industry sponsorships. Great. Bob uh, Bernard, how about Notre Dame? Well, there's a lot of uh, very interesting and good things happening at Notre Dame uh, as we work very hard to advance our research programs, but probably the one that's most relevant to today's discussion is an announcement we made two weeks ago. Uh, where the university announced that uh, we were, uh, with uh, five partners, putting together a $36 million facility uh, to do turbo machinery research. Uh, the facility is going to be located in downtown South Bend in the area uh, that used to be the Studebaker corridor, which hasn't been developed uh, in the 50 years that Studebaker has been, uh, been, been dormant, or closed, I should say. And uh, the university now is uh, going to build this facility. Uh, our partners include uh, General Electric Corporation, uh, General Electric uh, Aviation, who are, have guaranteed that they're going to do a certain amount of research. And that allowed the rest of the partners to come forward and, and put together the package to build this facility. Uh, the state of Indiana, the city of South Bend, and a couple other partners are involved in it. And we're looking forward to you know, building the programs that uh, over the years have been federally funded now uh, into uh, programs that the corporations will have access to facilities that are pretty unique and, and able to do their advancing their technology. Alex Cartwright, Buffalo. Yes, uh, we have quite a few things going on in materials and also in genomic medicine. Uh, what we've actually focused on is how do you work across disciplines. So a few of the things that I'd like to mention is our recent uh, announcement of a genomic medicine center, which is a $50 million investment from the state that builds on our computational capabilities and allows us to expand research in that area. But for some example, ex specific examples, we have SUNY Distinguished Professor Paris Prasad, who's actually had some of his technologies for nanoclinics actually make it all the way out into a, a company where nanobiotics actually recently went public and we were able to uh, di divest from that company. But also we have some exciting things going on where our junior faculty uh, Jonathan Lavelle, who is actually working also on materials for medical applications where he's doing nanoballons uh, to actually treat cancer. Sandra, how about San Diego? Well, UC San Diego has embarked uh, in January on the largest uh, comprehensive clinical trials coordinating center for the study of Alzheimer's disease. Now, many of you may know that Alzheimer's is now the sixth leading cause of death in the United States, and uh, the rates are expanding rapidly. This is a great example of a federal institution, the National Institutes of Health, coming together with industry partners, Eli Lilly and Toyama, to produce a study that will involve 60 sites across the nation 
and with a focus not just on understanding the process of the development of Alzheimer's, but actually designing um, or evaluating the effectiveness of a drug that's an anti-amyloid drug uh, that is involved in the progression and development of Alzheimer's. So this is a very exciting opportunity for us and we think that there will be new technologies, early diagnostic technologies that will emerge from this study as well. Richard McCullough, how about an, an example of something you're doing at Harvard that's kind of cutting edge here? So NIH-funded research has led to discoveries of uh, some basic uh, uh, scientific uh, molecules. Uh, there's a protein called REST, and this particular protein is, was only thought to be important in, uh, in developing children. And it turns out that REST uh, plays a huge role in preventing uh, neuro neurodegenerative diseases. And the discovery of this is, is really important because it turns out that uh, teenagers don't really have this because they're not stressed out like we are. And then when you're older, you get really stressed out and this rest protein kicks on and they figured out that this, once it kicks on, it actually prevents the formation of plaques and prevents neurodegenerative diseases. And so this is the kind of basic discovery that's really important uh, that leads to therapies once we understand how these things actually happen. And last but not least, Prem Paul, our friend from Nebraska. What's going on in Lincoln that we should know about? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, we have a number of uh, projects uh, uh, that I could uh, uh, showcase, but one that in, uh, has gotten a lot of uh, press is that the foodborne pathogens, you know, E. coli, sugar, sugar toxin producing uh, foodborns that uh, kills about 260, or at least 265,000 people become ill annually. And uh, about a couple of years ago, uh, uh, we put together a collaboration with 13 other universities and USDA, and this team uh, competed for a $25 million uh, USDA uh, competitive uh, NIFA grant, National Institutes of Food and Agriculture. And that team has really been working very hard to find ways to better detect E. coli, to better uh, 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 classify them, type them, and then uh, uh, trying to determine where this bug hides, and then can we come up with some ways to prevent it and control it. So this team is really working, it's very exciting. They've already been able to uh, devise methods uh, to detect that uh, they were not available before. Well, that's great. I want to thank all the SROs for those examples of things they're doing on their various campuses in various disciplines that are of interest and exciting uh, research that's going on. And it's kind of a, a good segue, I think, to our first section where we're going to talk about this connection between U.S. leadership in science and also our global competitiveness. So I want to start the first question by asking about the innovation deficit. This is the difference between what we are currently investing in research in higher ed and what we probably should be investing in, in in, the, um, in those disciplines, in those areas. Sandra Brown, from UC San Diego's perspective, what does this deficit mean in, in practice as it affects the research and education that you do on your own campus there? Boy, this is such an important and compelling issue these days. Uh, I think as we reflect on the federal funding for um, research, we know that in the National Science Foundation, for example, there's been a reduction in the number of R01 grants that have been awarded. Um, and if we look at the statistics from the National Institutes of Health, it's clear that about 40% of those students that we invest years of graduate training in biomedical education are leaving the basic science arena. Um, this is really an incalculable long-term consequence uh, for the United States in terms of the human capital loss, losing our edge in that way. Fewer students are motivated to continue on in the research arena. Um, I would like to say, though, it doesn't take much to create motivation for that, uh, for uh, people to continue and to see a future in basic science. Uh, Obama's um, Brain Initiative is a great example. We had several uh, graduate students who were participating in a discussion session just a few days after the Brain Initiative uh, was announced. And they had calls from uh, four different 
family members from four different countries around the world saying, oh, and now there's a future for the research that you're doing and that you're uh, conducting at UC San Diego. So I think it's a human capital issue. Other comments from our SROs on that, or from your perspective, how this might cause the U.S. the most harm? Are there certain, there are certain uh, areas of research that maybe we're going to see this be more affected by than others, maybe from your own campus perspective? Gord? Yeah, so I think that uh, the real focus uh, these days is on the idea that people should be involved in doing applied research. And I'm uh, terribly concerned that the lack of uh, respect for and uh, focus on people doing basic science um, is really going to lead us to a place where we really are losing um, in terms of coming up with um, all kinds of new ideas, technologies, developments, and those sorts of things. Basic science is critical um, to the applied work that follows it, but if we don't invest in basic science and don't value it, um, that will really result in um, a terrible situation for universities. Carol Whitaker. Um, I think, let, let me just build on those statements. I, I, um, I would agree with Gloria that basic, basic science, I think, would, would suffer. But I think the, what, what we need to understand and what I think one of the concepts that might be missing is that there's a pipeline of research and that basic research can ultimately lead to more translational or applied research that can ultimately be commercialized. So I think it's not as if we at universities are sitting on a pile of intellectual property, let's say. It really is a pipeline that develops, I think, from basic to applied to commercialization. Richard. Yeah, I'd like to add to what uh, Carol and Gloria said. I think one of the things that's very interesting about all this is that there's a big push to do what I would call first strike science. So to have very quick outcomes that we make an investment and then we expect that there's going to be, you know, 3,000 jobs that comes out of the first NSF grant. Um, you know, I, I got my first NSF grant in 1990. Uh, I started a company in 2002, which created 50 jobs that, when it was sold uh, in 2012 in Pittsburgh. And so it takes a long time for these things to, to take place. No one would have thought that measuring the magnetic moment of an electron would be an important thing that someone should fund, but without it, we wouldn't have magnetic resonance imaging. And so these things take 30, 50 years to realize uh, the outcomes. And so that's one of the dangers, not only the human capital, as Sandy said, this is so incredibly important where we'll lose our competitiveness as a nation uh, in the future, but this idea of, of will we build the basis uh, for the future. Uh, Dawn. And, and this is a, perhaps a mundane, but I think a pretty important point as well, and that is that with the innovation deficit, we have lower success rates on the proposals, for example. This results in increased administrative load on the scientists. So our creative scientists who are generating all these ideas are spending 40% of their time trying to maintain the support for the, for the activities. And so we need to pay attention to that as well. I'm looking at our reporters. Anybody have a, a general question in this area about the innovation competitiveness topic they want to jump in here with? Um, go ahead. Uh. Post. Uh, I'm wondering if um, any of you at specific universities have had to actually put the brakes on a specific science project because of a lack of funds. And if you can detail what that project was doing at the time that you had to put the brakes on it, please. Robert. At Notre Dame, we're involved with a project that is, extends probably over a decade. Uh, it began with uh, uh, the nuclear physics uh, community getting together to talk about what their priorities were, and they um, invested a great deal of time and energy. And you can imagine, uh, this is hard work uh, for them to uh, you know, winnow through uh, the different options of major facilities that they could, that they could uh, invest in or that they should be prioritized as the best. Uh, ultimately, they came to uh, understanding that one of the facilities that they uh, thought would, would yield the best science was a uh, un deep underground uh, accelerator project for nuclear astrophysics. And so that project started then into the, the design phase and so forth. Um, the University of Notre Dame was um, chosen to lead that project, a consortium of multiple universities, and uh, because of it, we had invested ourselves in 
the cost share of that, that program. Uh, the program went into design phase and actually uh, on a one year design phase they did a lot of work to come to uh, the point where they are ready to start construction. And this happened to be uh, right at the moment of uh, sequester. And in fact that particular project uh, was stopped at the, uh, at just at the point where the decision was made to move forward with construction. And so that whole uh, project has been put on the shelf. We're hopeful that it'll start again, uh, but uh, there's no guarantees it will. Um, I would note that our uh, faculty members were contacted by the Chinese government uh, not very long after uh, the project was stopped. And uh, there's been, you know, the potential now that, you know, it, and a foreign government can come in and, and uh, take advantage of all the design work and, and decision making that has been done on that project. Um, but, you know, so far we're, we're moving forward with a small scale example, hopeful that the U.S. government will move forward with it. No, we haven't. I think Robert Clark wants to jump in here. Yeah, I was just going to say to your question, um, less of things that we, w we might close, but in fact um, competitive grant renewals that aren't made as a result of uh, capsule and funding and sequestration. The real issue is, is that some of the very talented faculty in the labs, if they have to close a research program, you have a, a significant momentum with building your program in the labs. And once you close the program, even if the funding opportunity returns in three or four years, you've lost the intellectual capital that was in the lab. You've lost the ability to quickly respond and do the work. And so to restart that is a significant investment, far more than sustaining, than sustaining the programs. Any other comments in this area here? Uh, Glenn. So it's uh, to follow up on that, it's not only if a, if a program is actually discontinued, but if there's a hiatus in the program, you end up with the same problem of the personnel who have the expertise in the laboratory to continue the research. If they're, uh, if they're furloughed, then the uh, ability to reinitiate the, the, uh, the project is, uh, is compromised as well. So it's uh, not just if a project goes away. I think there may be fewer of those than there are of projects that are, that are, are put on hiatus and are very difficult to reinitiate. I have a comment from a question from Goldie here. Uh, yeah, I think Stan's question was not what is the threat, but has anyone actually closed things down, even in the wake of the sequester or something else? It sounds like one project, but I think we're wondering for something a little, I mean, we all understand the issues involved, but has anything actually happened? Yeah, I can respond to that. So, uh, well, first of all, there's, a, as you know well, it's a great question. Uh, you know, there are three to five, these grants often run three to five years, and then often people will have discretionary funds that they've sort of sacked away from various small gifts and things. And so there's a lag effect on what's actually going to happen. And so what we're seeing now is in the first year of sequester, there was, not, there, there was a few things that got impacted, but things are starting to get impacted. And so at Harvard, I have, you know, on a daily basis or a weekly basis, some of the, the best and brightest scientists in the entire world coming to me and saying, okay, I'm running out of money now. What is it that I, I should do? Can you help me raise money for this? And, and projects like, uh, there's a guy who's discovered new antibiotics and he has no money to continue to create new antibiotics. He might say, well, drug companies do that. Well, drug companies don't do that as much because there's less money in antibiotics, but that will be important for us in the future. And so, you know, we try to fund him internally as much as we can, but these kinds of programs are, are sustained. And so I, I could name a half dozen projects where people are coming to me and saying, please help me. I, my, my NIH grant just ran out. I got in the top 3% of my NIH grant and it was not funded. So can you help me come up with a half a million dollars or $250,000 a year so that I don't have to get rid of half of my people and start over. And these are people that are competing at the highest level. So I think there's a lag effect that, that you're going to see that's coming. So it wasn't like there was sequester and then we shut down, you know, uh, uh, several projects in the chemistry department or something like that. It's we're now trying to sort of weather the storm uh, for the next three to five years. And if it doesn't turn around, then you're already seeing groups cut by 25%, you know, research groups that are already being reduced by, you know, postdoc here, postdoc there, graduate student there, graduate student here. So it's already happening, but it's, 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 it's chipping away at the foundation. It's not obliterating the foundation. Jeff.
steady, sustainable funding. But first, if I could have a show of hands, how many people were in your position five years ago? Okay, so several. The reason I picked that, obviously, is because of the stimulus. So there's been a lot of discussion after the fact that the stimulus was actually harmful. Did any of you or your universities speak out at the time about concern that this $10 billion injection was going to have a deleterious effect on the slow and steady support for science? And if not, uh, why not? Robert? I think, I think pro I have to admit I didn't speak out uh, publicly, but we internally knew that there was going to be uh, an issue that we were going to have to plan for. We, had, we couldn't sustain some of the programs that were funded in the stimulus program, and, and we had, knew we had to uh, plan for that. So I think to the intro that you made is the, the fact that this, that our funding predictions are not, that things aren't very predictable for us, impacts significantly our planning. Because we do generational planning. We hire a faculty member for a 30-year career. Uh, we build laboratories with the expectation that the staff will be there for uh, 10 or 15 years. And we knew with the stimulus money that we were not going to be able to make that kind of planning. So we had to make different choices, who we hired, what we did, what we bought, and so forth as a result of that. Anybody else want to comment on that question? Prem. I think the, at the national uh, uh, meetings of our colleagues, we talked about that. There was a definitely concern, and we individually tried to express that to our delegation. There was a, uh, uh, there was some of the funding was uh, uh, used for infrastructure development, which definitely helped. We at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, we had two facilities funding uh, that if we did not have uh, stimulus funding, uh, those buildings would not exist. One is a uh, NIST competitive project on a nanomaterial science building, and the second was uh, from NIH uh, facilities grant uh, for uh, uh, virology research. So those uh, investments are paying off, definitely. So it's not that uh, stimulus money did not help, but it's the in the area of that uh, uh, competitive grants we knew that there will be a cliff, uh, and, and so we actually uh, had lots of discussion at national meetings and, and tried to make a case. Other reporter questions here on this topic here. Uh, I have a follow-up, which is, you know, we hear about this international competitiveness, you know, China, India, other countries really ramping up their research. Are, are they doing things the same way we've done it? Are they doing things differently? Are there things we can learn from the, from the ideas that they are developing as they try to advance their own science enterprises? Anybody have a thought about that? Uh, or, some, or, or, or are there approaches that we might think about using here that, uh, that maybe are being successful there? Sure, I'd be happy to start with that. Uh, I think a, a number, uh, and, and we're, we at the United States are looking at these countries and trying to see what we can do as universities to copy some of those uh, uh, models. Uh, in the UK, for example, if you look at University of Oxford, and Cambridge, and a number of the universities there, they receive about 13 to 15 percent of the research uh, comes from industry, sponsored research. If you look in the United States, uh, the best universities are around 7 percent, 6 percent. Harvard is about 4 percent, approaching 5. Uh, but uh, even at MIT and Stanford, more engineering-based are, are close to 8 percent. So there, uh, there are issues in terms of regulatory issues that, that stand uh, in the way of universities and corporations partnering together. And the Europeans in particular, and the Chinese and, and Indians and others have done a really good job at working on that and realizing that that's an important part of the future going forward. And so. Uh, that's one area I think that we could really uh, use some help. There's a lot of government-sponsored uh, laboratories like IMAC where uh, corporations uh, invest in uh, the infrastructure of these uh, manufacturing uh, areas and then the universities and small companies can come in and use that and then partner to create innovation within the countries. And we don't have a model like that here. I think the Advanced Manufacturing Initiative is trying to do that 
do that, but I think that's an area where we need to work harder in that particular area. It's not going to it's not going to be a substitute for federal funding because it's just not large enough, but uh, it is really important that we continue to work on those models. Graham, you had a comment. Uh, we ha had a, a, a national uh, technical uh, small group meeting on lasers, it's extreme light uh, science, and we had uh, representatives of uh, several top universities around the country and national labs, and, and so these are, the perp these are the leaders around the world in this area. And what was really, uh, 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 that got our attention was that they talked about that how little investments uh, we are making in the U.S. in the extreme light uh, laser area and how much of billions of dollars that European Union and China and others are investing in this area. So this certainly has implications in national security uh, and uh, biomedical applications and others. Right. Dawn. Um, and I can't point to a particular country or region of the world where this is, where a, a specific example for this point, but one of the things that we really do need to do in the United States is to ensure that we have the infrastructure to carry out the research we need. Um, our national lab system does this in, in, a, in some of the areas, in some of the uh, tech sector areas and, and basic science areas, um, but there are vast needs that individual universities and even sometimes regions can't afford to do that would facilitate research across the board in some of those areas, NAND manufacturing, advanced manufacturing, Manufacturing is one. Um, Mid-sized instrumentation is another one. Uh, networks for that. Um, and and um, the San Francisco example was talking about uh, centralized compliance for clinical research. That, that would help to facilitate as well. Cyber infrastructure and so forth. And there would be others that would come up. But this is an area where we have um, routinely underinvested in in, ma in, in manner that um, other countries haven't underinvested in so well. And, and one can point to several National Academy reports that make this case as well. Glenn Lane here. So uh, we should at least consider the fact that uh, if countries like uh, China are going to surpass our R&D investment maybe by 2020 from the, the, the latest report, that um, there's, a, uh, there's a different type of uh, research being done in some of these countries, which is much more top-down than it is uh, in the United States. And uh, certainly here, if you take a faculty member and try to apply a top-down approach to uh, research, it's been historically unsuccessful. So um, even though they're investing the money, we need to, uh, uh, I think that uh, our system has a greater return on investment than, than they will have. Yeah, sure, Sam, go ahead. Faculty or researchers uh, to a foreign country. I know uh, we talked about one that was, uh, had someone approached by China, but Robert Clark. So, so at University of Rochester, um, I would say it's a double-edged sword. In a sense, there's a um, an opportunity on the even on the law side. We've uh, had several faculty members now who carry appointments at international institutions in addition to our own, and they spend time at each at each place, and so. You, you lose the human capital for some period of the year, but the gain is, is that you can build partnerships with those institutions abroad. I think the, the, the piece that's interesting to look at, I mean, since 2001, you know, we've seen the major, major Asian economies grow their research expenditures to exceed that in the United States. If you travel, and I do a fair bit with our partner institutions, whether it's in Hong Kong or China or Singapore, you see incredible infrastructure in the labs. You look at university rankings and you look at endowment and research expenditures, the rankings pretty much follow the money. And so if we are, if, if other governments are willing to invest more in their fundamental research than we're willing to invest, then we're going to see those ideas follow the money. And that's, that's essentially what, ha what happens. Many of our faculty, they have allegiance to their research. That's, that's their focus. And wherever they can best fund those ideas, that's where they're going to work. Anyone else want to comment? Robert? Um, yeah, one of the other elements of this that I'd like to emphasize is that um, the, the pool of students that immigrate to the United States for their uh, education programs is vital to us. When I visit a lot of companies and, and national labs and so forth, I, the number of people that are at high technology and science positions that were not born in the United States but were educated here and stayed here is, uh, is, is huge. I mean, the, the numbers are, are uh, you know, preponderance of the many, in some of the companies that I deal with, they're a preponderance of foreign born. About 10 years ago, I started to notice that graduate student applicants to our 
to our programs. People working in their bachelor's degrees had access to better facilities than we could offer in our graduate programs. And so you begin to start to see this, or ask this question, how long will they keep coming? And I start asking that question when I, when I visit Asia, and I'm told they won't keep coming. They're gonna have enough opportunity at home, it's, uh, at high levels, with uh, you know, the stress on them, you know, the importance for them to stay home, uh, that talent pool is gonna dry up for us. So okay. that's another piece of it, you know, beyond what, uh, the f that fact we may be losing faculty now. Richard McCall. Yeah, just give a quick, uh, a quick direct answer. Uh, in my field, chemistry and materials, it's, it's famously known that lots of uh, Chinese, famous, very famous American Chinese researchers are, are built very big institutes in China and have left to move to China. Uh, Switzerland, I can give you a handful of names of people that have moved to the Swiss universities from the United States and, and are set up and to the point they don't have to write any, NS, any NSF or NIH grants at all and that's the promise and so they leave. We, lose, uh, we always lose people to Germany to the Max Planck system. We just lost one of our best chemists to the Max Planck system. And so this is a very common thing and they're set up very well and a lot of it has to do with they have sustained funding uh, as, as uh, uh, Jeff pointed out. Any other questions in this general topic of innovation competitiveness? Goldie. Yeah, actually, I guess I'm wondering about that because what we've been reading about the European economy doesn't make it sound like the European economy is that strong for this kind of funding. But then, so if someone could address that. But also, I mean, people spoke before about the basic science and, I'm, and I've also heard consultants talk about this era coming along as the era of mega gifts in philanthropy and people saying that research universities are the institutions best situated to be the recipients of such, such grants. So I'm wondering what anyone's doing in the, era, in the areas of developing um, philanthropic support for sciences and particularly maybe even for the basic sciences. Anyone got an well, answer there? Well, I think we're all aggressively uh, pursuing philanthropy. That goes without saying. Uh, I would like to, to mention that there is a, a science philanthropy um, alliance uh, of the six largest funders of basic science that has emerged over the past year. Uh, and the focus for that, for the um, science philanthropy alliance, is to fund scientists, not specific projects. Um, and, and the reason for that is just what you've heard. It, it has to do with the continuity that's necessary for basic science. Now, even though we pursue philanthropy, we pursue industry funding for research, it will never co fully compensate for the value of the long-range, stable support that federal funding for research can provide. Uh, at UC San Diego, for example, over the past four years, we've increased our industry-sponsored research by 81%. That 81% over just this brief period of time is less than half of the funds that were lost from uh, the federal agencies as a result of uh, sequestration. So even though we've aggressively pursued these things, uh, the, the nature of the funding, and I'm sure we'll talk about this in the technology uh, transfer side of things in a few moments, uh, is remarkably different. And it does take stable funding to, secure, to move down that pipeline from the most basic research out to science that produces social good and solves global problems. Any other comments there? Any other questions? Prem. I just would add, you know, all the universities are uh, trying to uh, raise funding from multiple sources, and, and so we at the University of Nebraska, one area that uh, we felt that was very important was water, because 75% of the water is used for agriculture, and uh, food is very important to Nebraska uh, uh, and the world. Uh, so in 20. 2020, 9 billion uh, population, how are we going to feed the world? So as a result of that, we've uh, had a lot of conversations and uh, uh, initiated a, a new institute, Water for Food Institute. And in order to really uh, kick that off, you need a lot of investment to be able to hire new faculty, 
to be professorship chairs and some operational funds. And we were able to make a case uh, to, a, um, uh, to a donor for $50 million gift. And so that uh, Doherty Waterford Food Institute, uh, because of that gift, has allowed us to put together a critical mass. But still, in order to address the issues, we still have to go and obtain uh, grants and funding uh, to address those issues. But it's, it's a great success, uh, early success. We've been able to leverage that funding from USAID, uh, funding from um, uh, Bill and uh, Melinda Gates Foundation, and uh, competing for uh, National Science Foundation funding and others. Richard. Um, I'd like to speak to this as well. One of the reasons I was brought to Harvard from Carnegie Mellon University is to take on exactly this problem. And in the last few years, we've increased our uh, corporate support by 350 percent. Uh, we've increased our foundation support by 50 percent. We've increased our uh, our uh, international support, support from other countries, by over 100 percent. But that only ends up to be about 250 million dollars. So uh, then we Harvard invests about 300 to 400 million dollars a year in research from our own coffers, uh, and and the federal government invests about 650 million dollars a year in Harvard research. And so it's we're we're running as fast as we can, uh, but but it's just it's just not enough. And we've raised lots of money. We're pretty Harvard's pretty good at raising money, and and so uh, we're we're doing everything we can uh, to do that. We just raised 60 million dollars. Um, uh, to support taking research from the lab to commercialization uh, so that we can create uh, more jobs and more com companies. So we're working hard to do what we can, but I think the scale of what Sandy was uh, referring to is really important to remember. I want to follow up on that. Richard, you talked about this, this, new, this new focus on foundation money and other industry funding. Is, is that a, become a different kind of research than, than the other kind of research you've been doing? Is there some concern that that will redirect the university's energies in other ways that would be not as well served? Uh, what do people think about that? Oh, that's a great question. Um, and I think uh, Sandy alluded to this already, or somebody did, that uh, you know it, these things come with strings attached. So a, a gift is fine, and it can focus on if it's a uh, if it's no strings attached gift, that's, that works fine. But often foundations are driven by various and sundry things that they want to uh, to uh, do some of that sponsored research. So it has, del uh, I wouldn't say deliverables, but it has uh, directional expectations in the research. If it's a pure gift, those are fine, and that works great. Corporate research is very different uh, altogether. They have, they have some of the best problems in the world, and we have some of the best tools in the world, and combining those two things, but then there's, you know, IP, and, and it's, it's often very directed. So it's not, you know, it, it's hard to get money from uh, a corporation to measure the, the magnetic moment of electron, you know, and so it's pretty obvious when you sort of characterize it that way. So it, it does sort of direct the research, and that's fine. It can be applied to basic all the way through. We're not afraid of doing applied research. We're, we embrace that, but it's just that we, we don't want to shift the pendulum too far. Glenn wants to jump in on that. It's here. also important to remember that uh, everyone's playing the same game. So I, I just came back from the Weissman Institute in Israel and was looking at some very impressive research and, and talking to them about this, asked about uh, funding. And they said all this research was funded by dollars raised within the United States. Right. Tracy from the Boston Globe. I was going to ask you, Richard, if you could please elaborate on some other countries that are investing in our universities for research and whether any of your other universities are also being invested in by other countries. Is it private industry in other countries or foreign governments? No, it's, it's, it's foreign governments. So um, often it has to do with building the personnel infrastructure within their own countries. And so it's generally research and education at its basic core. So that's our mission to do research and education. But it is funding often students coming from those countries or helping professors from those countries or projects that are in partnership with those countries. Uh, so that they can build up. And so, I, you know, different universities do it in a different way. Uh, some make pure partnerships with countries where they're actually uh, having research that's taking place in those countries, and then others are 
or where the research and education is at the mothership, as we might call it. So there's a whole group of models out there, and, and I would say, I can only speak for Harvard, that we're more on the sort of, you know, uh, uh, doing things at Harvard, although we do have partnerships and locations and offices in other countries. Gloria. So in this conversation, we've been really focusing on the actual level of research funding that we get, but I think an important thing to recognize is that research dollars go much less uh, far these days than they did previously because of the increased regulations and compliance that uh, is in place. And so faculty spend much of their time, uh, some studies have shown up to 42% of faculty time is spent on compliance and regulations as opposed to actually using that money uh, to, for the research that we want to have carried out. And so not, it's, it's a really large decrease because we're putting less money in and then less of it actually goes to the research. Um, the government has just come out with a new OMB circular which has many more regulations in it and is going to make the situation even worse for uh, our faculty and has many um, regulations that are really going to be difficult to comply with. And so that's also a factor uh, other than just the overall level of funding that's available. Uh, Unless people have other questions or comments, I'd like to switch gears a little bit. We've, there was an allusion earlier to tech transfer, and I'd like to talk about that for a few minutes. Tech transfer and, and the growing role universities have in sort of regional economic development. Uh, Dawn, at, at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, why is tech transfer important, and what are some of the things you're trying to do to make it more efficient, more effective on your own campus? I think a good place to start with that is to remind ourselves what the academic mission is, and that is to, to educate the students and to create new knowledge and to do that in a manner that has some positive impact in society. And it's in the context of that positive impact in society that we feel an obligation to move the discoveries into, into a, a, a mechanism in which that they can, they can contribute. And sometimes it's a, a treatment or a cure for a disease. Sometimes, you know, if you're an artist, it's artwork. But in terms of technology, that pathway is to take it to the marketplace so it can make more of an impact. Um, so what we've been doing at Penn recently is we've established a Penn Center of Innovation in which we're changing the model by which we do that translation. Um, and it, instead of having the, the traditional tech transfer operation be licensing and fees and royalties and that sort of thing, we're evolving into uh, a, a new kind of um, interaction in which we focus on corporate alliances, alliances with the, with the university and private partners, um, as well as uh, venture startups and startup companies and that sort of thing. And one, one example of that uh, recently that's been in the public news has been an alliance we have with Novartis that's over a hundred and some million dollars and has to do with a, a therapy that's developed by Carl June in which um, immunotherapy, using your own cells to, to fight cancer, for example, is showing great promise. Um, so, so we've launched that, that new approach. It, it, it has the uh, component of having teams of the professionals that can do all of these activities in remote locations or at the faculty um, access points um, and then investing in something like new start, startup companies. A part of that component, uh, this program is called the Upstart Program and it's a concierge service for faculty on campus for startup companies. It's been really successful so far in this four years. I think that there are, I'm told, 17 campuses that are emulating it in some form or another now even in that short period of time. And the final component of this is that we're, um, we're developing an innovation uh, campus, if you will, in, in concert with and collaboration with the city of Philadelphia, and we call it the South Bank Campus, in which we are going to spend around $50 million building an innovation center called the Pennovation Center. That'll be a physical place where, where these activities can come together. So we're bringing all of those things together with the hope of also encouraging those jobs, a high fraction of those jobs to be local within the Philadelphia area. Carol, I know Ohio State, uh, like Michigan, big state university, publicly funded in some sense. Uh, there's, there's an expectation now that we're going to become bigger players in the economic region that we live in and try to spin off companies. Talk about that, how that works at Ohio State. Well, I think, um, yes, there is that expectation, particularly among land-grant universities, that you give back to the, to the local environment. And I, I would just cite really one example of We've recently set up an industry liaison office that, that really represents a portal. It's a single point of entry, really, for industry to, to access the university. This has been a tremendous, um, a tremendous change, because when I started in my position, there was really a queue at the door 
for industry wanting access to faculty. And what I came to realize is it wasn't just industry folks wanting access to the faculty, it was really wanting access to the students that, that, that we actually produce. And so we've set up some expectations actually for that, you know, for that um, access to students. There must be an investment back to, um, back to the university in the education of those students. And that has actually been actually fairly well received. Um, one of the, so that, that means actually investing in career fairs. That means not just showing up and you know, accessing students, but that is investment in the, you know, in scholarships. Um, it's investment in, in, in career fairs. It's support of student clubs. It's volunteering of time of those industries to actually come and speak to those student clubs. So it's giving back to the university, you know, to, par to participate in those students' education. And that has been, that's actually been, been very well received. But one of the, what, one of the um, d so sort of different things we've actually tried at the university that I think is fairly innovative is coupling the, the industry liaison services that we do in the Office of Research together with development, together with career services, together with contracting, so that when industry comes to the university, they see one face, um, and that is that you know access to students is really the same sort of face of the university as access to research, access to facilities. So it actually, I think, makes us much less siloed, you know, inside the institution and presenting a much more um, fluid face to, to industry. Alex from Buffalo has a comment. Uh, I'd like to follow up on a little on what Carol's saying. We, we have a similar type of structure. We have an Office of Economic Development, which actually is charged with uh, reaching out to industry and working with industry. But one of the things that I'd like to mention is that in New York State, we're actually fortunate in that our governor, Governor Cuomo, has actually been very proactive about positioning the university centers actually driving some of the economic development. And I'll give you a little, a few examples of that. He, he established what we call regional economic development councils across the uh, re uh, 10 regions across the state. And within each, each of those regions, there's co-leads usually of the regional economic development council. In, our, in Western New York, our president is the co-lead of that Regional Economic Development uh, Council. And that has allowed us to actually be very active in the whole process of how we build the economy. The governor also announced the Buffalo Billion, which was an investment in, the bill, in, in Buffalo of a billion dollars to actually change the economy. And it's seen that the University of Buffalo is supposed to be part of that, moving us from a Rust Belt manufacturing economy to a knowledge-based economy. And he's done that in real ways, and that is, we've announced, I mentioned earlier, a genomic medicine uh, network, which is a $50 million investment from the state, and that is in collaboration with several companies where we're actually going to be de delivering about 600 new jobs over the next five years. And that's a substantial uh, building of our, of our at least, community around Western New York. The other key things that he's done is he's also uh, allowed us to partner with EWI for a Buffalo Manufacturing Works 501c3 that's separate from the university, which allows us to more readily connect with industry through a separate entity so that there can be a little bit of delineation as to which problems are being solved where. We're interested in certain problems. The last one that I'd like to mention is really quite innovative, and that is Startup New York. Startup New York is an effort whereby all universities are allowed in New York State, SUNY system and the privates also, are allowed to actually have companies on their space and that space is designated as tax-free zone for 10 years. This is tax-free for the company but also tax-free for the employees. This is a way of promoting economic development and tying directly to the academic mission and so we have to think about how that works, but it's a very interesting time. I think your colleague wants to jump in on that here. Well, so you've covered, covered the Regional Economic Development Council and Startup New York and such quite well, so I won't reiterate that. But I will say our president's also the co-lead for our region as well. And I just want to take a minute to, to kind of distinguish between the economic development piece and our role in terms of transfer of knowledge and, and translation, because the reality is, is that you know, in a city like Rochester, and we are a private institution, so I would say that the communities look to privates and public. It doesn't matter if you're private or public, they're looking to you for leadership in these domains. 
And the reality is, is that, you know, in a community where Kodak used to employ 60,000 people and now is a few thousand people, and Rochester is now the largest private employer in all of upstate New York with nearly 22,500 people. So they look to us for jobs and look, they look to us to generate innovation for new jobs. And so one of the things we've really focused on in, in similarity, I'd say, to what you're doing at UPenn is established UR Ventures. So we took our tech transfer office and basically created a venture creation shop. So we're really looking at all the ideas at the university from their potential for startup companies or for their potential for licensing. And we are investing some funds internally that we raise through philanthropy and through our own dollars, but a very small portion compared to the amount of federal funding that comes through. We really have to, you know, I liken the, the example is that the community wants fruit. If they want to go to the grocery store and buy fruit, we have seeds. Nobody's sure what's what fruit these seeds will bear, so they're not really willing to buy the seeds. So we have to do a little bit to grow the plants to actually make this a viable uh, ongoing venture. And that's where the investment comes in that bridge funding that, that is lacking from fundamental research investment to actually the translation side. So we've been trying to bridge that gap, and I think that's critical. It's, that will drive economic development, but that's different from just being a resource in the community. It's about creating new opportunities. Prem, that's coming. Uh, we also have a, a very exciting project. Uh, we call it the Nebraska Innovation Campus. Uh, it's a 250-acre land uh, uh, right next to the university. And, and actually, our first phase of building has just been completed. Our focus has been, uh, uh, based on the recommendation of others, uh, of food, fuel, and water. And our first major uh, corporate partner is ConAgra, that who's going to be co-located with our uh, scientists. And the model that we are pursuing is like uh, mentioned earlier, is that uh, we don't want them to be just landlord, but actually be really a collaboration, the scientist to scientist working uh, side by side and having um, our students uh, access to those, uh, 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 those uh, 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 collaborative research. So we're early in this stage. Uh, the, but uh, the future looks uh, very exciting. Robert. Um, I'd like to second, first of all, what Rob mentioned earlier. It doesn't matter if the university is public or private. When you have a community like South Bend or a region like North, Northern Indiana, they're looking to the universities to help. And so we, we have great engagement with the region and the city to talk about what opportunities there were. Uh, this is not a throw it over the fence model. They're very much interested in, in uh, collaborating with us in any way they can to help us recruit and so forth. I would say purposefully we've worked on two, two strategies that both had mentioned, but, I'll, but I'll, I'll try to frame maybe a little bit differently so that it, you give you some things to think about. From the corporate perspective, we've begun to look at our interactions with corporations as co-innovation co labs. Uh, we, you know, the model in the past has been a research contract to do a specific uh, piece of work. We're recognizing that these companies can go anywhere in the world. The Max Planck uh, uh, programs in Germany were mentioned earlier. These are outstanding research programs. Uh, corporations that we deal with have access to them. They don't have to come to us if, if we're not world class. And so we're realizing that we have to go, we have to be world class, and we have to create the environment so that we are working together with their scientists in the same laboratory. On the uh, startup and the entrepreneurial uh, front, we've recognized that, in fact, we've done a lot of benchmarking. We've recognized that your geography makes a lot of difference. Where you are and what access you have to capital, but particularly what access you have to talent is huge. And I think we're, we're hearing things from the federal government now that are, are, that are sort of beginning to recognize that having and facilitating this you know, identification of talent that can lead these entrepreneurial efforts forward where the, it's just a seed to begin with and there's a big risk that has to be taken. If we can find some people to do that and bring them, in our case, out of the Silicon Valley or Boston area uh, uh, to help us, uh, it would be a key for us moving these things forward. There are other things for us to do to create an ecosystem for entrepreneurship but we recognize that we've got to be a player. We've got to, we've got to get in that uh, field with the community and do it. Sandra. We 
mentioned the pipeline of science earlier, and I think there have been a variety of uh, examples given already um, similar to some of the things we do at UC San Diego. But one thing that hasn't been mentioned is that really, as our students come to us, they are the business people, they are the science pioneers of the future. And so we are focusing on ways to interact earlier in their academic careers at an undergraduate level with industry and corporation partners. So, for example, we developed what we call the Undergraduate Research Portal, which any business can come to articulate uh, opportunities for placements for students. And we do essentially a match.com with student interests and the industry interests. This has been remarkably effective. Uh, so industry partners don't have to comb through hundreds of students applying for jobs, but only those that fit their criteria. And similarly, students who are looking for placements in industry as important experiences or prerequisites for their job training can sift through all those businesses and find just the ones that are the right fit in the right direction for them to dry up, try on. So I want to mention that our model is that we start this technology transfer all the way from uh, the undergraduate level on up to our most senior scholars. We now even have launched the MOXIE Center, which is an undergraduate innovation center on our campus. So I think all of colleges and universities are really appreciating, pre appreciating the idea that uh, good notions, good uh, disruptive thinking doesn't just occur with senior investigators, but it starts all the way with those who are entering our campus. Research dating, who knew? Uh, Richard. Yeah, I want to pick up on Sandy's point. I think it's a really great point. I think uh, uh, all the universities uh, over the last several years have really spent quite a bit of time uh, promoting entrepreneurship and, and trying to uh, I would actually call it catching up with the undergraduates because the undergraduates are already there. There's been a complete paradigm shift. The undergraduates are used to think about going to, to big finance firms or consulting firms now. Their first job, given the economy and the difficulty in finding a job, is to start a company. And we see now that more students probably are actually thinking about their first job as starting a company. And we're actually just provide, trying to provide portals for them uh, to do that. So at Harvard, we created the, the iLab in 2011. There's, there's about 100 little companies that are incubating in that space. There's been over 35,000 visits a year since it opened. And you know we didn't do anything in particular that's that's, that's super creative. There's a building and there's some cheap furniture and we put some smart people in there and, and it's just the human capital and the, and the students and the brilliant people that are coming there and the ideas that generates its own momentum and excitement. And um, you know, our new campus at Alston is, uh, is an innovation campus as, uh, and an academic campus but one that's going to try to capture that momentum and expand upon it uh, even further. So I just want to, I think that's a really great point that Sandy was making, it's really undergraduates driving this as much as anyone. I want to see if there's any reporter questions in this realm about uh, tech transfer, innovation, entrepreneurship that we'd want to get into here. Yes, Alan. Yeah, I'm uh, Alan Kotak with uh, Science and Enterprise. Uh, we heard early, early early on here about the uh, brain brain drain from uh, uh, how we're losing uh, scientists because of the lack of funding isn't isn't there also a risk that you might lose scientists to uh, industry and startup companies? also with this emphasis on uh, tech transfer? Who would like to tackle that here? Robert. Uh, the young faculty who we hire at the university, one of the questions they talk to us about is what, what is the uh, university's pro policy on intellectual property? I used to not hear that question at all some years ago. I think it's a healthy thing. Um, 
we are in the business of transferring knowledge to society as a whole. Sometimes that requires the individual to take a company forward, sometimes it doesn't. I don't think we ever, at least at the University of Rochester, we don't think about that issue as being something uh, that we're worried about. If we, we, if, if we find someone who needs to move out with the company, then they would do that, that we would, we would fully support that. And certainly the students, the postdocs, graduate students, you know, are, are an integral part of that. So it's the transfer of knowledge we prioritize first. Uh, Dawn. So, so part of that, you might be referring to the people who come out of the university instead of perhaps going to what you might call basic science jobs would end up going to start companies and doing things like that. And I think that as long as we keep the core of our basic science activities healthy, there's nothing wrong with that, with some of our people graduating and going out and, and, and making this impact by creating, by, by taking these discoveries into the marketplace. I think, in fact, that's exactly what we want to have happen, is for some fraction of our, of our graduates, for us to be training the people who will be who will be the um, the uh, sort of the intellectual capital that who will be the people we'll rely on 20 years from now to solve the new problems that come up, whether they're in the context of a company or a startup or or residing right at the university. So with the caveat that we need to maintain that basic science, so the pipeline is always there. It's not negative that our people are graduating and going out into these different avenues. Carol and then Robert. There's a much more fluid um, relationship these days between universities and, and companies. I know when I was a graduate student 100 years ago, it was um, if you left the university and went to industry, you couldn't come back. So that is very different today. So, you know, let's face it, many of these companies will actually fail. Um, not all startup companies succeed. And so often we see people coming back to the university, and that is much more commonplace these days to actually go back and forth between industry and, and universities. Uh, for me, this is sort of personal. Uh, my son is a PhD student in biomedical engineering, and uh, I'm biased, of course, and I, but I think he'd be a great teacher and researcher at university. Uh, he's already been involved in three startup companies. Uh, one at Columbia and two at Purdue. Um, and he's looking at this idea that there's five and seven percent success rates for grants. And you know, this is going to be a tough decision for him when he graduates. Uh, unless somebody has any, oh, Paul. Paul. Uh, uh, Paul, Paul Baskin with the Chronicle of Higher Ed. Um, Bob, Robert Bernhard talked about the idea of trying to attract people into the area from either Silicon Valley or Boston. And, and sort of one of the questions I've had in general on the whole notion that universities can serve as a, a job creator for a region is what else it takes to get people to stay there. I mean, if, it's, if, you're, if you're a university in a, in a place that people just don't want to live there for whatever reason, and I'm not saying Indiana's one. No, I'm, I'm not saying, no, I'm, I'm from Boston, so I'm biased, but in any event, but. Yeah, um, last no. <laughs> but, um, but, but, but I mean, if, if, but seriously, if, if, it's, if that's, how much, how, you, you talked about it a little bit, you alluded to it, but I'm just sort of wondering what exactly the university's job is in that regard to make the community or the region a more desirable place to live beyond what the university does in the university's own backyard? It absolutely is one of the motivators for us to be interested in it and, in, and we invest in it because to recruit uh, faculty and their spouses to the university requires the region to be economically vital. And uh, this is, you know, we put that hat on, that good neighbor hat on, uh, in large part because we need to have a vital community for our people to, re to recruit people to the region. Go on. And, and we have uh, we have uh, some tools to do that with, some big tools to do that with. So, um, with Penn as an example, the the budget for Penn is about three billion dollars. If we don't include the health system, let's say, that's thirty thousand jobs in the region. And oh, and um, Penn took on a policy about fifteen years ago to say, well, with that kind of a budget, we want to help the local community, the local region, just economically develop, not with startups or anything, but just by virtue of having, of enacting policies such as a certain percentage of the procurement that we have or the services that we have have to come from within five miles, right? Not within the state of Pennsylvania even, but within five miles. This activity was directed toward West Philadelphia and it transformed West Philadelphia from an extremely struggling, economic struggling region to a vibrant community right now. It really was a transformation. And that's just a demonstration about how we can use these other aspects of our institutional 
let's say, size or, or resources um, in order to do exactly that. And we, don't, and we do it for a couple of reasons, to be a good neighbor, of course, to partner with the city, but also to, to, so that the environment improves and people will want us to, to live in the region. Goldie. Yeah, some of the startup companies get formed and they often move and they pick up and they go somewhere else. So I guess I'm wondering, are some of the economic development expectations that you're getting from your states or from other public places, are they realistic? Uh, you know, it's been a very interesting experience, uh, kind of starting, you know, innovation campus, a dialogue, and then uh, getting some support from the state and kicking off a state fair uh, to two hours away, and that would turn out to be a very, very political uh, issue. At the time, uh, our, our uh, chancellor went and had a lot of meetings. I had met others, lots, lots of us had a lot of meetings and tried to communicate to general public, it's going to take time. It's not going to happen overnight. And that's the major question. Uh, you know, a lot of, once you start a, pro a project in something like this, <coughs> we're working uh, very closely with the city we're working uh, with the private developers, and there is a period that uh, there is a progress is going on behind scenes that you cannot talk about that. And everybody's anxious, what's going on at the innovation campus? And they're looking for that building and they're looking for the occupants. So that's really the, the part that we had to deal with uh, uh, quite a bit. Other than that, uh, once uh, they learn about it, we can feed them some information, they're happy. Sandra had a comment. Yes, I think that's a wonderful question. Um, I think we, we need to think, just as we've been talking about the universities as being broadly partners with the community, mu multiple industry partners, we can help the economic development by taking sort of a cluster perspective. And let me give you an example of what I mean by that. <clears throat> Uh, we heard allusion to the Silicon Valley. Well, everybody knows that's a great biotech uh, arena. We have a similar one in, in San Diego. And we've actively fostered um, uh, through our 200 startup companies, active companies that are in and alive in San Diego today. I say alive because, of course, you know, many, many have moved on to uh, other pastures. Uh, but foster this notion that competitiveness is an advantage. So we want multiple biotech companies in San Diego. We, we want multiple clean tech, clean energy companies in San Diego because you attract the talent to an area best when they know, geez, if this job doesn't work out, there are other alternatives in this city, in this community. I can build my family here. I can be successful here, if not with this company, with another top-notch company. So we see part of the job in the university to spring those startup companies out and to foster this sense of connection in an area. And I think that has helped us uh, be successful in the relatively short time that UC San Diego has been in existence. It's 50 years, we're at a billion dollars in our research enterprise now. Um, and, and I think it's because of that sort of cluster perspective that we've taken. Richard, I'd like to pick very, up on Sandy's point. I think um, the universities, uh, we stewards of the taxpayers' money, uh, we create technologies or things, and then all we can do is help the students and faculty members to start the companies and, and if we can get gifts to help kind of get the company launched, we can do that and provide whatever if we can find, find some space for them or something. But we can't do a lot to help them be successful, um, you know, uh, because that's just not what we do. It's not our business. Uh, so we're trying to stay out of the way as much as anything and just promote these companies. And, you know, back to the question as last, sorry, I've lived both, I've lived both uh, 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 scenarios. I, I, I was in Pittsburgh for 22 years. Uh, I spent five years developing an innovation ecosystem in Pittsburgh uh, that helped to attract uh, Google and created uh, probably, uh, uh, almost, be, you know, hundreds and hundreds of jobs there. Uh, and then now I live in Boston. And so uh, this idea of trying to, 
uh, I used to say, Pittsburgh's not like Boston and San Diego and Silicon Valley. It's like the rest of the country. Uh, so we represent the rest of the country. And so trying to, and so what we just tried to do is create a lot of startup companies, 60% failure rate, but to create some wealth within that area and some excitement within the Pittsburgh region to attract capital, attract talent to the region. And, and in the end, there were a number of companies, Google's a great example, that moved to the area. And why would they move to Pittsburgh? Well, the, my, my favorite story is it was a sign in California, uh, in Silicon Valley, that says, you know, four bedroom, three bath house, you know, and it has, shows a beautiful picture of a nice colonial house, $350,000, and it says, uh, Google Pittsburgh. You know, and so, I mean, it does have some advantages, and it did attract some people there. Uh, it was at one time and then moved out. But I, this notion of, uh, I just, I think it's a great question. And uh, I used to say, people would say, oh, you know, all these companies, they're being successful, and they're all moving to San Francisco. And I said, fantastic. We're creating companies. We're creating jobs. We're doing what we're supposed to do. If they stay in Pittsburgh, we'll do the best we can to keep them here. But if we can't keep them here, we, we, you know, they'll move and they'll be successful. And hopefully they'll give us a big gift one day, you, you know, because that's really what, you know, we hope. And then that can fund research that will help us out. Sam so. Stein has a question. Yeah, I guess I should I'm play a bit of devil's advocate on this. Um, sequestration uh, obviously was crippling for you all, but in the last budget deal, uh, Part of it, uh, at least the NIH funding, was uh, restored. Not all of it, but part of it. And I'm curious if uh, people can talk whether that's uh, had a soothing effect, whether that's helped you all, uh, whether you've seen uh, the impact of the restored money, and if so, in what ways has it helped? Any comments there? I mean, too soon to tell, I think, is the, is the answer. I mean, we're, we're I mean, it's a, the lag period. It's, it takes six to nine months to, uh, sub, from submission of an NIH grant to getting it funded. Uh, so I think we don't know yet. I, I, I mean, I don't know. That's not, maybe that's not the question, answer you're looking for, but no, that's. I'm looking for the honest answer. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> we're well, nothing if not honest. So, that's the honest answer. <laughs> so, so I'll give you an honest like, example. Which one? Go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> okay. um, also, what I would point out is that we, yes, we were all very relieved to see that sequester is still not there, and some of the rate, some of the funding levels come back up. But we have to have a reality check and realize it's not up to the levels it was in 2003, and and we've had inflation since then. And as was pointed out, the cost for each thing has gone up, so it doesn't look like an optimistic outcome being flat funded for a decade. I mean, that, that's causing us some challenges. Sandra. So what we don't know yet, but what we're currently facing now is we don't know what the, um, the scientific loss is by not having um, that uh, full recovery, if you will, of funding. We don't, we don't know that yet. We do know how um, that reduced funding ha impacts us on a day-to-day -day basis at each of the universities that are here and universities across the country. And I see that in two different ways. One is that individuals who are able to maintain their laboratories and continue their science are in many cases, based on the, the uh, federal institutions that they're funded by, are doing so at lower levels. That means there's a difference in uh, the funds that they had to direct specifically to the research projects. Um, and we don't know the long-term impact of that, but that's not a great trajectory if we ha spend more money on administration and less uh, money on the actual conduct of the research. So we will see that. that. That impact will be evident down the road, as Rick said, it, through this lag effect. The second thing, way that we face this on a day-to-day -day basis is for individuals who do not have the continuity in their funding, where it's created a disruption in their science, in their staff, in their facilities. Um, we face every day requests for bridging uh, funds for senior scientists who are doing top-notch stellar research uh, but, but now have a disruption 
that's unprecedented. It's, it's really hard for me to believe that uh, funding below 10% as it is in, in a number of institutions uh, isn't going to leave a lot of good science on the table that other countries are going to be interested in picking up. Richard and then Glenn, just very briefly, because we have another question. So just very bri briefly, just to touch on the talent issue, um, I, have a, uh, I had a, a, a young woman working in my lab, an uh, uh, African-American uh, postdoc who's a superstar, and I've been working on uh, developing the pipeline uh, for diverse uh, uh, talent in academics. And, um, you know, she's a, just one example, but she said, I, I can't see doing this. It's too difficult to go into academics. And so she went, she went into industry. And I mean, that's great. She works for a great company and she's doing great things. But the idea of her focusing her talents on doing basic science and also contributing to society as a whole uh, in academics is something that I personally, uh, you know, worry about. And the reason is because she said, I, I just can't see doing what people do. Uh, when you have to write 10 grants a year and the, and the hit rate at NIH is 2 or 3 percent, you know, I, I'd rather go into industry and have a, a day job where I get a paycheck and I don't have to worry Quickly, about this Glenn sort of and stuff. Gloria, very short. So I too worry about the continuity of our, uh, those who will, uh, you know, backfill for us when, when we retire. And uh, instead of worrying primarily about the senior investigator who might be, under, be able to undergo a funding hiatus and perhaps teach some more or whatever, it's right. the junior faculty member who's working on promotion and tenure who has a finite window in which to do so. And if they don't, then they're going to be looking for employment elsewhere. Right. Gloria, quickly. Right. And I think that this means that we're really, the, the low funding levels means that we're really only funding outstanding science. But there's a lot of very good science. And outstanding science only happens on the back of a lot of very good science. You need to do all of that work. So just because the sheer amount of research that's getting done is much less than it would be if the funding levels were higher, then we're not going to reach the level of outstanding science. Jean Russo. Uh, um, my question kind of relates to the last two questions, I guess, in a sense. There was this notion of the cluster perspective and cluster approach. And I guess I'm wondering to what degree tight budgets are affecting the ability to have uh, robust clusters, as it were. In particular, I'm, I'm interested if you have any thoughts. I don't know how directly this affects you, but I'm probably something you're looking at of uh, institutes, independent institutes that are uh, really dependent on soft money, like Scripps has been in the news lately. Um, and in those cases, they're really dependent on NIH funds, right? Um, so I, I wonder if you have any comments on their future, how they're being affected, and how this might affect collaborations at your universities, for example, or clusters. Who wants to try with that here? I think increasingly, even states are requiring universities or asking universities to work together for large projects. So a good example in Massachusetts is the Mass Green High Performance Computing Center, uh, which is out in Holyoke. And so the state asked us five universities to collaborate together um, in order for them to put money into the MGHPCC. That has turned out to be extremely successful because uh, those five universities are now collaborating on other research. So for example, a faculty member at BU headed up an initiative for the Massachusetts Open Cloud, which resulted in uh, the Mass State putting in $3 million and industry putting in $16 million towards the creation of this Mass Open Cloud. So I think states are requiring universities to collaborate, and I see that as a good thing. Carol. So I think this, this is a larger problem than just at the, you know, just at certain private institutions. I think, as, as Gloria mentioned, the, 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 the state institutions really are faced with this as well as our funding declines from the state. So it really calls in question, I think, really innovative funding strategies. And I would cite a couple, um, actually from my own campus. One, and don't laugh at this, is a, we monetized our parking assets. And this was something, we're not in the parking business, we're in the education business and the research business. And so, but what that did was it generated a check for $480 million that was then put into the academic mission of the institution. You know, part of this went into the endowment, part went into actually hiring faculty. So it's, and we've done this, a similar thing with affinity deals. Um, affinity deals with insurance companies, with banks. You know, they are the official business, whatever, the insurance company, official bank, of the Ohio State University. So that comes with a, an expectation for dollars. So I think the, these really innovative financial funding strategies, we've got to really think out of the box 
these days. Glenn. So uh, along those same lines, as we look at more and more expensive core facilities, uh, Texas A&M University has linked with the University of Texas and Rice, the other AAU schools in, uh, in Texas, to, uh, to pursue uh, joint purchases on things that it is not reasonable for each of us to have a new widget. A comment or a question from Jeff Mervis. category, the intersection of science and politics. Great. Um, the organization that's sponsoring this, AAU and Science Coalition, have come out against the first bill, which is legislation I think you're familiar with regarding reauthorization <laughs> of NSF. And I wanted to get your perspective, since several of you are from red states, how, what does it say about the community's ability to get its message across if not a single Republican on the House Science Committee voted against that bill. Do you feel that there's this political gap uh, in trying to get your message across? And if so, uh, is there anything that you can do to try to narrow that? Carol, you want to take a shot at that here? That, that, that is a great question. I'm from actually a purple state. Um, <laughs> And sometimes we're blue, sometimes we're red. But I mean, I think that, that one of the things, um, I, I think we've done a lousy job actually communicating about science to our legislators. I think we can do a much better job, you know, and I see that, you know, we, we, we've tried over the years to actually do a, um, do, do a much better job of, of, of actually talking about outputs of research. And one of, my, one of my house members said to me, you know, at one time, you're giving me input measures. So I was talking about funding. I was talking about, you know, the, the, the inputs to research. And he sort of refocused my thinking, and he was absolutely <coughs> correct. We need to talk much more about the outputs of research. What are the publications? What are the patents? What are the companies? That's what he's talking about in terms of, of, of outputs. There's a, there's a new project out there called U-Metrics that actually is about the outputs of research. It's about things like where, is federal, uh, where, where are federal dollars spent? And this project has created a map by county of the United States and where the federal research dollars are actually spent. That is actually, that has resonated much more with the um, with our representatives, than than just about anything else has. Uh, there, yeah, I, I suppose I should comment since I'm from Texas, uh, and that uh, probably red state, uh, and and we tend to view this as that uh, we're kind of all in this together, and that um, uh, everything I do on a daily basis is for the good of the uh, citizens of the state of Texas. We're also a land grant and space grant and sea grant institution. And so the, um, the, the Congress certainly has oversight uh, of research, and they need to know, to know what's going on. But at the operational level, I think most of the people around this table, whether they're at land grants or privates or whatever, are trying to operate in the best interests of the, uh, their localities and the nation in general. Other uh, comments? Ann, you have a question. Aside from the funding issue, what are some other um, policy issues that you're concerned about these days? So, who wants to start? Glenn, you want to start there? Well, I'd just say that uh, I think many around this table will have compliance issues. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, whether it's uh, use of humans in research or uh, select agents, uh, certainly we need to uh, hold people's feet to the fire so they operate at the highest possible standards. But if it grinds the entire research operation to a halt, it's probably not in anybody's best interest. I th oh, Alex. I think it's also important that we attract and retain some of the best minds in the world, and that means we need to think about immigration reform. Robert? And I think we definitely have to have on the table, uh, as been mentioned earlier, the administrative load that our faculty face and our universities face. It's, it seems to be continuing to rise, despite the fact we're showing 42% um, of the time spent by our faculty members doing administrative work 10 years ago, still at the same number now. Uh, let's, so we've got just a few minutes left. Let me throw it open to anybody. Tracy. I was going to follow up on the subject of immigration reform. 
what is being done now given, I mean, do you have any hope now that the Senate bill is dead from last year and our focus is so much more on the border? That, that one I'll have to ask my government affairs person exactly where that is. <laughs> um, I actually don't know uh, where it is, honestly. I mean, but I, I know that it is dead from last year, and I just hope that it's reconsidered and that we start thinking about how do we keep those people in the country. The, they, they, people come here and contribute to this economy. They make us a world leader, and we're investing heavily in educating these people. We don't want to lose them. It's a significant investment. We should take advantage of that investment and, and build the economy. So in the plan coalition, are they you doing anything more right at this current time period, or are you waiting until next the next Congress? That, yeah. Let's let's have, let's yeah. why don't we, unless somebody has a specific comment, we can I think we can follow up with that afterwards yeah. and give you some specifics about yeah. that immigration issue. That probably from a federal perspective. Other yeah. other questions on any topic that we want to cover here as we kind of bring this effort to a close here today. Or any any last points that you wanted to make that you haven't had to make, haven't had a chance to make, uh, any of our research officers? If there's something you were just dying to say, is there something you, this is your chance to say it now, real quickly, before we wrap up here. So uh, there, there's one point I'd like to make, and that is that um, I want to underscore the value of the media having well-trained, technically knowledgeable uh, reporters. Mm -hmm. Uh, that can go a long way in serving as a megaphone or a microphone for the voice of science. Having people who really understand science, being able to articulate that to the lay community is something that's important to us. Not all of our scientists are great pu public speakers for a lay audience. Almost all are great in terms of speaking to their scientific colleagues. So I just want to make that, that point that we can't do this alone, and we really value uh, the technical knowledge of uh, the media reporters. Carol. So, so there's, there's a topic that really hasn't come up here, and I'd just like to throw it out there that, and this is a, an area where I think universities are really going to play a major role, and that is in the area of data analytics, where you know, we are surrounded by data and we are, we're struggling with how to, how to interpret that data. You know, I think you've got expertise in computer science, you've got expertise in statistics, mathematics. You know, there's no better environment than a university to bring all these disciplines together in how to deal with the, the mass of data that's out there. I think you're gonna be seeing some brand new metadata analyses, um, I've got several examples actually that I can give, but there's lots of, of analyses in climate, in crime control, in um, food and water analyses, in genomics, that when you look at many, many publications together, and that's what a, a kind of a meta-analysis is, you are gonna find you know, just, just jaw-dropping sorts of conclusions. So I think that's, that's an area that I think you're gonna see dramatic advances in uh, data analytics. And I think that that technology is gonna really be coming out of the universities. Go ahead. And I, I think we should probably keep an eye on the, uh, the uh, uh, National Research Council report, which would uh, indicate, and I would agree with this, that many of the breakthroughs in, in the coming years will come at a point at the convergence of the physical and the biological sciences. Mm -hmm. Richard. Uh, I, I think this is sort of a, a a higher level point would be that universities play a role in solving really hard, really long-term problems. That's what we do. And corporations don't often do that because they have quarterly reports to worry about. As an example, maybe some do, some don't. That part of the sector has dropped off. That's what we do. We, we take on really hard problems. We're, we're not bound by anything except trying to get enough funding to do it. Uh, to solve these big problems. And the impact that comes out of that is often profound uh, and takes a long time to get there. And so I think that's, that's sort of the, one of the messages that we, we do research and we do education, that's what we do. But, but we have the advantage of taking on these long-term problems without having to worry about getting it solved next week. And if that paradigm changes, then that's, that's an issue. Robert. I would also add to that 
that we also represent the repository of knowledge and resources for the nation. We stick with problems because we're making generation-long decisions, and we become the resource when this thing becomes hot. I can remember early in my career, nobody stayed batteries. All of a sudden, batteries became important, and the universities were where that was done. In the social sciences, nobody was paying attention to Central Asia. Then those people that had persisted in looking at Central Asia now became really important. And Robert, the other Robert. So just maybe for me, just a closing comment. I mean, we live in a nation where our higher education uh, industry, if you will, has been the envy of the world. And I think um, we're all here because we're committed to making sure we stay there. And that includes welcoming people from other parts of the world to study here. Um, but it, it takes a collective commitment and a collective communication on the part of those that are here, here, here today. So, Well, on that note, I'm going to take the prerogative of thanking all of you for being here today. I think this has been hopefully useful and informative. And on behalf of AAU and, and the Science Coalition, I want to thank all of you, both reporters and senior research officers, for being here. Uh, I know that some of our SROs will be available afterwards to talk individually one-on-one, -on -one, and you can also follow up with Barry and Sue with any additional questions that you have. And with that, we're adjourned. Thank you.